So this session is on the latest in encoding technologies, and uh, today's uh, speakers will highlight some of the new developments going on uh, first into MPEG-I. Our first speaker is the Director of Image Technologies at Dolby Labs. He's been around the industry for quite some time, Mr. Walt Husick, and he will give us a, um, uh, a speak on um, the status of MPEG-I. Walt? Thank you, appreciate that. So I'm gonna uh, give a brief uh, presentation on the uh, MPEG-I efforts, and particularly I'm gonna talk about OMEF. And this is sort of, sort of a lead-in to a presentation following mine by Jill Boyce, who will be talking about what MPEG's uh, uh, current and future plans are with M uh, MPEG-I, or immersive. So first I would like to talk about exactly what is MPEG and, and what, what's its interrelationship with the industry. And it sort of starts off with ISO and IEC. ISO is a, uh, a UN group or a group that is it's not necessarily under the UN, but it's specifically chartered by the UN to do some interface work. And IEC is a well-known industry organization. The two of them together uh, joined, created a technology committee called JTC1, or Joint Technology Committee 1. There's a number of TCs in both IEC, some of you may be familiar with TC100, and then in ISO there's a TC36 and TC42, which some of you may be familiar with. But in the case of JTC1, it's a common uh, group that covers multimedia applications for both ISO and IEC. Underneath that, there's a number of subcommittees, ranging from SC02, which I don't remember what it is, up through SC29, which is the one that's relative to us, is multimedia applications, and up to TC42, which is one of the newer uh, subcommittees, and that one covers uh, blockchain. From there, there's two working groups. Uh, working group one is uh, what we commonly know as JPEG, and working group 11 is what we know as MPEG. And both of those are tasked with, in the case of JPEG, still image, and with uh, MPEG, uh, moving images and audio and uh, transport. Parallel to that, ITU uh, has several groups. There's ITU-T, ITU-R, ITU-D. T is the one that's of interest to us here. Some of you may know R uh, with some of the radio uh, telegraphy work. Uh, underneath there is a, there's a series of specialist groups. And in this case, uh, study group 16 is the one, or a study group, study group 16 is the one that's of interest to us, which Jill actually happens to be a, one of the associate rapporteurs of. And underneath that, there are specific questions. Um, Question six is the one that's interesting to us, and under that is a group called the Video Compression Experts Group, or VCAG. And actually, to be uh, honest, that's the one that Jill's the associate rapporteur of. So it's sort of, sort of an ITU parallel to MPEG, uh, dealing strictly with, uh, actually MPEG and JPEG together. Um, in fact, the J and JPEG is joint between uh, ISO IEC and ITU, so it's a permanent uh, joint committee between the two. However, on a task-by-task -task basis, uh, there are joint committees that are developed between VCAG and MPEG to do uh, motion and compression work. Uh, first one was uh, for JCT, or that, the one that developed uh, AVC or H.264, and then most recently was the JVET, uh, JVT, which developed HEVC or H.265, and then currently there's the JVET, and that's uh, creating a new standard, uh, VVC, which Jill will cover in her presentation. All of these um, are, are scoped around video coding. Uh, so these are task-based joint groups between the two based on video coding. So in MPEG, there are subgroups underneath it, and the subgroups are the ones that basically monitor the work going through. The first subgroup is requirements, and that kind of sets the, the stage for explorations and prepares for eventual projects. There's video that covers, you know, it's kind of self-evident, covers video work. Audio that covers audio work. Systems, which co covers transport. And then test, which ensures that um, the, the technologies are all tested adequately prior to standardization. There are a couple other smaller groups, but these are the groups that are of most interest to this discussion. What's key in all of this are the ad hoc groups. The ad hoc groups control the uh, operation or the flow of a standard through its processes. Now, the ad hoc group can do a number of things, but one of the key tasks of an ad hoc group is to move a standard through. 
An ad hoc group generally starts with requirements as an exploration. Somebody will you know, mention a use case or some industry need, and the requirements and different um, use cases would be developed for those needs. And in this case, uh, if we were to develop an audio standard, the three groups would work together. The ad hoc group would control it and requirements and, and audio groups, subgroups, would actually develop it. However, for us, in this particular case, we're gonna be focused more on the video side. So initially, between joint meetings between requirements video, the ad hoc group would vet the uh, exploration, then the use cases, and then finally the requirements of the specific project. From there, a CFP may be issued, a call for proposals, and then test would be involved with requirements, and the ad hoc group would conduct a call for proposals. It would issue a, a detailed call, proposals would come back, and then test would uh, test the, ver the test subgroup would test the various proposals, and then report back to requirements. So once an adequate technology or set of technologies is identified, then the group goes to video. The ad hoc group reports to video, and video controls the process all the way through. And at this point, there would be a number of uh, different steps, which I'll cover in, a, in a, a slide in the future, and it would lead to the final standardization. And once you standardize the core video, and it could be audio also, but the core video technology, then at that point, you may consider the transport of that technology. It may fit into an existing transport system, or it may fit into uh, a new transport system that needs to be developed, depending on the modality. So this is the generalized standards process, and as you look at the various steps here, it pretty much starts with a new work item proposal. Somebody proposes something, gets, goes out, gets balloted, um, and then there, a working draft is developed. And a working draft is a development under uh, a, a document under development, or it's a, a document under process. And once there is sort of a, 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 a confirmed and agreed upon technical uh, document that's, that's ready for balloting, that gets issued as a committee draft. And that's the first technical ballot. And then traditionally there's been a final committee draft or a second technical ballot. And then you would do an edit, two editorial ballots, a you know, draft international standard and final draft international standard. And finally you'd go to publication. Many of you may recognize this as simply follow similar processes. So the names are almost identical here, but similar processes. And for other groups, the same process holds true, however, they have different names. Now, much like the other groups, um, you know, ISO, IEC, and ITU have, have looked towards trying to streamline the process, and they've recognized that they could drop some of the steps. So the FCD, or final committee draft, has been drop, and F this has become an optional step. So if it's a simple ballot, you could do, uh, you could just uh, skip the final um, draft international standard, or F this, or if it's a very detailed document, you may want to send it through for a second pass and an editorial uh, fixes on it. So <clears throat> now, now that I've kind of discussed how MPEG works and its processes and, and its structure, let's kind of, you know, move into the, the core of this. You know, the first question is, is, you know, what is VR? So VR is an immersive media experience in which a user can get a sense of really being there and where, where, where and when the media was captured or as it was modified. So that kind of you know, encapsulates what the general task is for doing VR. And this is sort of the, 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 the overriding um, objective that, that MPEG was looking at when it started launching the, the MPEG uh, I project. So achieving immersive VR is challenging. It's not a simple task, as many of you know. You can read, and some of you have worked with it. On the visual side, you know, the, the, the quality of the visual imagery, the pixels themselves, has to be very, very high. The view has to be spherical. It's, the, the world is not planar like, like we're used to looking at. And then we see things stereoscopically, so we, you know, the, the, whatever the VR system that you're looking at, or the immersion part of it, needs to really be able to deal with the stereoscopic aspect of it. The same you know, parallels hold true with audio, too. The audio needs to be very high resolution, and then also the audio has to be 3D. The, the direction and the locations and the points have to be realistic for people to understand it and to, and to feel like they're actually in, in, in the VR experience. And then there's sort of the, the interactions with the world or the interaction with the virtual environment that you're in. You have to have minimum latency. Any kind of delay is going to uh, you know, cause issues with your sense of reality and, and to some extent may lead to uh, you know, uncomfortness. 
you have to have natural user interfaces. The interfaces that you deal with with the future virtual world needs to feel like the interfaces with the real world. And then you have to have you know, precise motion tracking. You have to be able to look and feel and sense objects where they really, really belong. So what is OMAP? So OMAP is a, a system standard, so it's a transport mechanism developed by MPEG that defines a media format that enables omnidirectional applications, media applications, that's focused on 360 video, but includes images and audio, as well as associated time text or captions or other information that comes with it. So that's basically what OMAP is. So it's an uh, omnidirectional media application format. So it's, that's gonna be key in all of this. So the, the, this is the sort of the timeline uh, with, uh, with OMAP. MPEG started looking at, at uh, VR uh, standardization and started the project in October 2015, so that's three years ago. So the, the, there's a lot of work been done and a lot of work that's still going uh, on in, in, in MPEG-I. The proposal started coming in in, October 20, uh, in February 2016, so there was a, about a five, six month period when proposals started coming in for the work. And then the first working draft, you know, I mentioned what working drafts were, um, sorry, it was in June, so it was a couple months after, four months after. Um, and that, and that was sort of the output of that, that June meeting. And then the first committee draft, so the first ballot, was in January 2017, approximately two meeting cycles afterwards. So a little, um, a little over a year ago, actually about, about a year and a half ago. And then the draft international standard actually came out in April of 2017, and then FDIS in October, uh, six months later. And then sometime this year will be a publication. I'm not sure exactly what the status is, but at some point this year, the publication will actually be out. Uh, so this is the first version of the OMAP standard. So these are some of the participants in the group, and you can see there's quite a number, over 30 uh, participants in that group. So it was a pretty active effort in in doing this. So here's the architecture, and you know, basically the architecture takes in the video and audio coming in, and it does a bunch of segmentation and uh, encapsulation of various encoded files, and that's delivered to a player, and the player is what's key in all of this. Ooh, I do have a laser. So up here is basically the capture and the, the segmentation delivery part is here. So this area here, is the, the basic OMAF player at, or the architecture of the player that's designed in it. And it basically the player will take in the, the files and then also the files will be modified based on the orientation of the viewport and the person's um, uh, you know, eyes and, and their, their situation inside of the interaction in the, in the virtual world. Uh, and then finally, once you do the decoding and then the rendering, and rendering based on the elements that are uh, extracted from the files and the segments, uh, those are sent to the devices, the, the whatever uh, display device and whatever um, audio system that, that, that's being used. So this is the conformance points. Conformance points are very critical to uh, MPEG because it defines uh, where the actual interchange of the um, particular device is. In this case, it's the OMAF player. And you can see that the, the conformance points here is after the decoder, but prior to the mapping of the uh, imagery onto the particular display that you're using. So that's a key thing to remember. The conformance point is after the decoders, but before the mapping system. So let's kind of move to the coordinate system. The coordinate system in mpeg -I, and Jill's gonna get, get into much more detail than I'll uh, on this. Um, and it's basically a three-dimensional coordinate system. But key to all of this is the user is located in the center here and looks outside into the world. So the world is projected out from the user in this virtual sphere that's out there. And where that becomes important is um, the, the different projections that are gonna be used. Now, one of the, the key things we do here is we have to look at two different ways of uh, capturing the content. And one is to do it monoscopically, and the other to do it stereoscopically. Monoscopically is obviously the simplest way to do it, and stereoscopically is a little bit more complex. You have the, you know, at least two, if not more, images that you have to deal with. But in both cases, the imagery comes in, oops, the imagery comes in, and then the stitching and projection is done on it, and then that uh, projected picture is packed uh, in, within regions, or it's optional whether it's done it, and then those packed pictures are encoded and sent on. 
Now, there's a couple of projections that are key to OMAF. Uh, the first one's equirectangular, and this is the one that we're all kind of used to when we look at maps. And it's basically the, 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 the sphere is projected onto a flat space. And of course, with the globe, you see that the, the center part is uh, pretty much one-to-one, -one, but as you get to the two poles, the polar regions, they're stretched out. Um, <clears throat> And then a second is a cube map projection. In a cube map projection, you, where you take um, uh, you know, six different uh, cube fa uh, faces, or six different planar faces, and project them from the sphere, and then connect them together onto a, a flat planar space. Now, MPEG is very, very good at compressing and doing image processing on planar devices. And there, were, there was a, quite a lot of work was done to try to do some sort of three-dimensional mechanism, but it turns out with all the expertise that MPEG has, that planar projections seem to work the best for the various uh, coding schemes that were used. So region-wide packing is kind of like the ROI, you know, the region of interest, and it's adapting the, those same philosophies and uh, same benefits to the, the packing mechanism to use. It's not mandatory in OMAF, but it is allowed and can be used in OMAF. <laughs> and you can see down below that the, um, uh, the, the, the regions can be packed in a variety of different ways. So rather than just having a region of interest being a tile of some sort or a movable tile, it can be packed in a number of different ways, reminiscent of the frame packing that was used for 3D. So these are the OMAF processing steps. As you do the, um, the stitching and whatever rotations and then projections that you use, once you do that, then you do the frame packing, in particular if, uh, if you make use of the region-wise packing, and the same with the regions. And then you encode it, and then you encapsulate it, and then transmit it. And then, of course, the, the, uh, the decoder, or the, the decode side, the rendering side, is the opposite where the file that you unencapsulate or you, you parse the file, you decode the imagery. If you do, did regions and you did uh, do frame packing, you would undo those two steps. Then you do the inverse of the projection, you do a, the, uh, any kind of rotations that you had to do and then you render back out to the display. Once you do the rendering, it's the opposite of the projection that you did earlier. Again, you start from the viewpoint being in the center and then you project out as if you were looking out from a sphere. Um, now, in, in actual implementations, MPEG doesn't really define how the implementation is done, so you could do the implementation as a series of discrete steps, or you could do some sort of clever uh, image processing and develop a system where you either skip steps or combine steps together. So <clears throat> next I'm gonna talk about the ISO base media file format. In the uh, file format, it's, it's basically the, the, a, a, an or object-oriented file, file, filing system, and it's based on data structures called boxes. And these boxes uh, you know, define exactly what would be followed in the various tracks that's in there. And in this case, you know, separate media, uh, uh, the data and the metadata, they can be separated in the, the tracks, and they can be identified specifically, so you can make use of either all the tracks or some of the tracks, however your, your, your system is required. Many of you might, might recognize this, this is very similar to the way MXF is done in SMPTE. And so some of the same concepts that were applied to MXF were also, not surprisingly, applied to the uh, ISO BMFF. Now, most of you will know these as, as either MPEG-4 or Motion JPEG-2. They're, 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 it's the very similar systems here. So in ISO BMFF, a little bit different than MXF is you have box hierarchy and very detailed box hierarchy. I don't claim to understand this stuff. Um, there, we have some great experts in it. And interesting enough, the image and audio experts tend to not hang out with the systems experts. It's like they're completely different beasts. Um, however, uh, it's pretty widely used and, 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 and it's, it's pretty popular systems that are out there. You know, again, QuickTime, MP4, all of those uh, you know, make use of the ISO BMFF. And this is an example of, of a file, what it may look like. And again, you know, those of you who work with MXF or TCPs can sort of understand this and see uh, you know, how the, how the uh, box system is structured. So here's the timeline, and, and Jill will probably get into much more detail on, on what MPEG's doing and what the various steps are here. But the original uh, OMAF system was, was basically was, you know, put out the final ballot in December of 2017. 
Um, and it covered OMAF, and inside of OMAF, it used either HEVC or AVC plus SCI messages. And then the audio is MPEG-H audio or simple AAC audio. And then the next step that's being worked on right now is uh, what's called 3DOF Plus. And again, the, system's, uh, syst the system is going to be OMAF, uh, so it'll be encapsulated in OMAF. Um, and again, the, the video will be HEVC or AVC plus uh, metadata. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and audio, again, will be MPEG-H. And then eventually the movement to 6 off where it's true uh, 3D interaction with the world. And then video is going to expand into point clouds, dense light fields, you know, many others uh, are being considered at the moment. And then audio would be uh, slightly different, where it would be, um, uh, you know, rendering audio-centric uh, or centric audio architectures. And then uh, at the same time, there'll be some work in what's called uh, NMBP, NM, NBMP, you know, network-based media processing. And then there's also in parallel a uh, number of metrics being uh, worked out for uh, subjective and objective uh, uh, measurements of the various uh, audio and video. So in summary, I reviewed MPEG's structure and um, how MPEG processes uh, its standards, it creates its standards. Uh, MPEG developed OMAF to deliver omnidirectional media, and it's the omnidirectional media applications format. Uh, OMAF uses video projections onto planar surfaces because MPEG's really good at that kind of image processing. The compressions uh, at currently is standard MPEG codecs, um, and then transport is the conventional ISO BMFF format. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I especially want to thank uh, Yakui Wang, uh, who gave me a lot of the slides for this, and he you know, works for Huawei. And this can be, the, these, the, some of the core work that I took this from is from an MPEG input document, M41993. Uh, so I'd like to thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please tap the like button and also subscribe to our channel to receive notifications when we add new content. For more information about us, please visit simpty.org. We'll see you next time.